this presentation is on the GU exemplar of acute renal failure or acute kidney injury. Acute kidney injury or acute renal failure has three types of renal involvement for the risk factors. Pre-renal occurs in 60 to 70% of acute renal failure incidents, and it includes fluid volume deficits, burns, medications such as ACE inhibitors, severe dehydration, blood loss, and significantly long periods of decreased blood pressure. Intrarenal, which is inside of the kidney, occurs much less frequently, about 20 to 30 percent, and these include crush injuries or intense physical activity, and you will note that a lot of football players are now wearing kidney protectors, Nephro long-term use and um, inappropriate dosing of nephrotoxic drugs such as mycin, antibiotics, and or Lasix, and blood transfusions. Post-renal incidence is really less than 5%, and these typically is obstructing the flow out of the kidney, such as a kidney obstruction or blockage. We see this with patients who suffer with BPH, have blood clots, or are not emptying their bladder. It's also typically high in can prostate cancer patients, cancer of the cervix, and or colon cancer. There are four phases of acute renal failure, including an asymptomatic phase, which is phase one, decreased renal function, which causes an overload-like state in phase two. Phase three includes diuresing and becoming fluid deficit, and phase four occurs with recovery. Assessment findings in phase one and two look pretty similar. So we need to understand the relationship between creatinine and GFR. Creatinine goes through the glomerular filtration piece of our kidneys. They inadvertently have an inverse relationship. So if the creatinine is elevated, meaning it's not being filtered out, we know that the GFR, the filter, is not working, so it's decreased. So physical findings in phase one and two include a decreased urine output, Kussmaul re respirations because they're trying to overcompensate for the metabolic acidosis that they're suffering with, they become fluid overloaded, their calcium levels drop, and they show signs of anemia. Labs and diagnostics include increased BUN and creatinine, increased phosphate, increased potassium, decreased calcium, decreased GFR, positive urinary sodium, an ultrasound CT and MRI can be utilized to look at the structures within the GU system. In regards to nursing interventions for phase one, acute renal injury, if it's a pre-renal problem, meaning it's occurring prior to entry into the kidneys, we want to make sure we're doing volume replacement and monitoring strict I's and O's as we will with any renal patient. If it's an intrarenal problem, meaning it's occurring within the kidneys, we want to try to remove the toxins. We're also going to check the myoglobin levels to see if that's breaking down. And we want to look at the diuretics that we may or may not be using in order to help remove and get rid of those toxic wastes. And if it's a post-renal, meaning it has already gone through the kidneys and it's after, we either need to remove that obstruction or fix the trauma. Nursing interventions for phase two. Again, we're going to look at strict I's and O's, performing daily weights, monitoring your BUN and creatinine because it's increasing, potassium is still increasing. What are we thinking about with patients with an increase of potassium? Cardiac dysrhythmias. Calcium decreases during this phase and phosphorus ele is elevated. 
So we want to restrict sodium, potassium, and the fluid that the patients are taking in. Now remember, these patients are fluid overloaded. If we are encouraging our patients to take in calcium, we want to remember to encourage vitamin D intake with it so that it can be metabolized adequately. EKG may also be on your order list. Maintaining bed rest status. Promote pulmonary function, including encouragement of use of an incentive spirometer or IS. Monitoring oxygen status, oxygen saturation. We want to maintain skin as they're going to be in bed rest, so making sure we're moving them, making them comfortable. And then focusing on their neurologic status. Are they alert and oriented or are they becoming confused? What's their baseline and what's changing with that? Pharmacology utilized in phase two, we want to give loop diuretics. We want to pull the fluid out, so we're going to give Lasix. But please remember, we need to monitor the potassium levels. We might be giving bicarb to correct the metabolic acidosis with the changing of the potassium levels and the other buildup of toxins within the body. We want to give calcium, and we need to make sure, again, if we're giving calcium supplements, we don't want to forget giving the vitamin D piece of it. Phosphate binders might be used in order to reduce the absorption of phosphate, and they need to be taken with meals and snacks. So we need to make sure we're monitoring the intake of that along with their meals. If they're if we're monitor if they're getting nephrotoxic drugs, we want to focus on them. We want to look at the dose ranges. They may need a lower dose um, if it's still warranted for them to maintain that. So looking at that, we're going to look at penicillin, cephalosporins, their diuretics, any aspirin or NSAIDs, IV contrast medications chemotherapy drugs, as well as any radiation treatments for cancer. Assessment findings during phase three, they're gonna have one to five liters of urine output a day. They're still gonna be acidotic, but they're gonna start changing over. They're gonna have a little bit of weight loss because that fluid's being pulled out. They're gonna be hypotensive, specifically orthostatic. Their mucous membranes are going to be dry, and they're going to have poor skin turgor, which are all symptomatic findings of fluid volume deficit. VUN and creatinine, we want to focus and look at that. We want to show and monitor the fluid and electrolyte imbalances, specifically focusing on sodium and potassium. Nursing interventions with phase three include monitoring your BUN and creatinine and your electrolytes. Your BUN and creatinine during this phase are still probably elevated and inadvertently are going to get higher because you're dehydrating the patient out more. We're going to need to give IV fluids. Low dose dopamine is a great pharmacologic intervention during phase three because dopamine at low doses will augment the renal blood flow by the action predominantly on the dopamine 1 receptors on the renal vasculature causing vasodilation. It increases renal blood flow as well as promoting adequate diuresis and safe diuresis. With all of our renal patients, we're going to be doing daily weights, monitoring strict I's and O's. We do want to continue with dietary recommendations, including administration of calcium supplements. At this point, we may be excluding potassium and sodium restrictions as these levels are going to start going towards a normal range. We want to keep an eye on these in order to adjust dietary restrictions as needed. And the calcium, we can also probably start decreasing during this intervention phase three. In the last phase of acute kidney 
injury or acute renal failure, the urinary output now becomes normal. BUN becomes normal and creatinine starts to improve closer to a normal range. Your electrolytes, electrolytes normalize, including sodium, potassium, calcium, and phosphate. This particular phase may last up to a year. If a patient needs more invasive treatment for acute renal failure or it occurs very fast, they may need to be put on hemodialysis as a temporary fix. That could be with a Shiley, they probably would not intervene operating and inserting a fistula. So these patients might need to stay in the ICU and get CVVH, which is continuous Veno, venous hemofiltration, which is just continuous dialysis machine with an ICU patient. So instead of going three times a week, they would be on it continuously. This concludes the acute renal failure, acute kidney injury lecture.